Okay. <clears throat> so far we've gotten up to 1910, and the period in which Wright left the United States uh, for, well, several months, mounting to considerably more than a year, two trips, two quick trips to Europe. This was with his uh, newfound mistress, former client's wife, which made him so unpopular uh, with the citizenry of the Middle West, who were all very proper. And of course, they never had mistresses or anything like that, ha uh, ha. <coughs> and he went to uh, Berlin initially, and then on to Fiesole in Italy, where he established a, a small studio with a couple of his apprentices, and they drew many of these drawings that were published in the uh, large Bosnian folio, these uh, plates of Frank Lloyd Wright's work that were so very important for architects, first please, around the world. Now, um, we have several times seen some of these drawings. This is the Winslow House of 93 that we talked about, and this is this slide is made from one of those plates in the Vosmuth drawing. Now, many of these drawings were originally prepared not by Wright's hand, but by various people in his, his studio, the studio in Oak Park. And I particularly like this one because uh, <coughs> Mr. Wright wrote here, uh, uh, drawn by Mahoney. Now, Mary Manny was the one who made many of the drawings in Wright's office. She eventually married Walter Burley Griffin, and she made all the preparatory sketches for the <coughs> uh, development of the capital city of Australia, Canberra, which won the International Prize. So it says, drawing by Mahoney after Frank Lloyd Wright and Hiroshige. So you see Wright is suggesting <laughs> the two sources uh, that she is drawing on. She's drawing on him, Frank Lloyd Wright, and Japanese prints, because Japanese prints were so important. All right, so Wright had this uh, period of hiatus in Germany why, and in Italy while preparing the final rendition of these Vosmos folio plates. And while there, he actually designed a house for himself that was to be, he thought he could build in Fiesole. Fiesole just outside of Florence, up in the mountains. It never got built. He also thought that when he came back to Chicago, he would need a house in Chicago. And he designed this house for himself uh, in Chicago. Neither of these buildings were built. Of course, when he got back to Chicago, he was persona non grata. Uh, he therefore decided to move back to the family farming area in Wisconsin, near Spring Green. Next, please. Uh, and this is the old gateway. There you get the spelling if you need it uh, for Taliesin. Taliesin is actually <coughs> a Welsh term. The Wright family were Lloyd Joneses. They originally came from Wales. Uh, and Wright therefore picked up this term, Taliesin, which means shining brow. And the shining brow, of course, was the house that he was going to build on the brow of the hill uh, in this area of Wisconsin. Now, all the exterior photographs, color photographs, I'm going to show Taliesin today are photographs that I took when I went to visit Mr. Wright at Taliesin in 1955 and 1966. So you see it as it was when Wright was actually there. That's just how old I am. But anyway, uh, uh, I mean, the kind of changes that take place. Here you see Wright left the natural uh, landscape a bit rough and, and as, as uh, it would grow by itself after he died. And if you see any more modern photographs taken during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and so on, you'll find that this has been cut with a lawnmower uh, and has been, uh, you might say, gentrified and so on. But these photographs that I'm showing you 
our while Mr. Wright was in residence here at Taliesin. Next please. Um, here are the plan. Uh, like any uh, architect's building, it grew. Uh, it was never static. Here you see a fairly early plan. And in this plan, you see the approach was at this point. This was 1911 approach uh, by a horse and carriage uh, to the uh, uh, house. The entrance to the house, you came under this, whatever you want to call it, a breezeway, a covered way. You came in, here's the entry. Uh, the dining region is here. The living room is here. These windows look out on the lake that we just saw in the previous photograph. The drafting room was here. Uh, later, this became Wright's private office when he developed the drafting room over at uh, Hillside. And uh, eventually, Taliesin expanded and expanded and expanded. The entrance was changed to being here. This became an entrance court, really where you parked uh, your vehicles. Then you walked up here, and uh, <coughs> in about the fifth or sixth pair of slides I show you, I'm going to show you that approach, how Wright led you up to the entrance to his house. Now, at this point, uh, the roadway that we saw over here is no longer being used. It's a path. Wright has expanded the building considerably in this direction and built his own uh, bedroom and study in that part of the building. Uh, the uh, various buildings along here that were originally farm buildings and storage and sheds and, and horse stables and, and cows. In other words, basically, all of this was a farm initially. In the 1930s, he moved the farm. I showed you from the exterior of the farm buildings previously in lectures. And what he did is took over all these farm buildings and converted them into residential accommodations for the uh, Taliesin Fellows when he founded the fellowship in 1932. Uh, so there are these many, many changes that occurred. Uh, then, too, there were fires. Uh, he built the building initially in 1911, uh, and then, well, let's go on to the next pair. Uh, here's a view of it in 19, this is a 19, a photograph of it in 1911. Then in 1914, while he was working on a building in Chicago, the Midway Gardens, uh, one of the servants, uh, actually, I mean, it's a horrific story. One of the servants, uh, locked while serving the main meal of the day, locked the doors to the dining room, uh, left one door open, and under the other doors he poured a gasoline and oil and lit it. And as all the members of Wright's household left the dining room through the one door that they could get open, he stood there with an axe and simply put the axe through seven skulls and murdered seven people at one time. Included amongst them was uh, Wright's uh, friend, Manuel Borthwick, with whom he had gone to Germany. Uh, and she was a wonderful person. I mean, I, I think Wright would have been a very different man if he'd been able to live with Manuel Borthwick all his life. Uh, but she was murdered on this occasion her two daughters by her previous husband uh, were murdered, and many of, of Wright's uh, uh, draftsmen and office workers, as I say, a total of seven were murdered. I think it was only something like two got, got, a, got away with their lives. They jumped out of a window and broke their <laughs> an arm or a leg or something like that, but at least uh, did not uh, uh, get murdered. Okay. So that's the 1911 building that was burned uh, in 1914 by this deranged servant. And after 1914, it was rebuilt. The part you see in this oldest photograph is that part right in here. Um, and many changes have already been made. In fact, this great oak tree that Wright particularly liked fell down last year, just last year. 
uh, did that go down? Now, an important thing to notice is materials here. We've talked about materials before. We've seen the use of brick uh, and of wood and lath and plaster. At the Willits House, 1902, and many other works during that first decade, Wright was using uh, lath and plaster and wood trim, or he was using brick and wood, as we saw, for instance, at the Martin House of 1905. Now, this is the first building that he really built that is not in suburbia or in the city. Uh, it's way out in the country. The nearest city is 30 miles away, which is the capital of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Therefore, uh, he uh, felt that he had to use different types of materials. And what he chose was local limestone. And he wanted it to look as though it was quarried, just the way it was quarried. When you quarry limestone, you get slabs, you get sheets. I mean, you don't get round boulders or something. And so he would always lay up the, the limestone stones uh, in such a way as to create this rough surface uh, on the exterior of the building. Then in certain areas, such as you see here, were lath and plaster. So uh, uh, in other words, it's, if he's using masonry, uh, it is the limestone as opposed to the earlier use of, of brick uh, in, in uh, a city context. Then uh, <coughs> in 1925, uh, that second Taliesin burned, and that's how we speak of them. We speak of Taliesin 1, Taliesin 2, Taliesin 3. Taliesin 3 was built, and these are my photographs of in 1955-56, when Mr. Wright was still living there. Um, and uh, here's that same entrance area that we saw in the two black and whites a minute ago. Uh, the two black and whites, of course, were the earlier, Taliesin 1 and Taliesin 2. Uh, the approach, you see originally the roadway in Taliesin 1 had come up through here, made a right angle turn and going in this direction toward the farm buildings. Now all of this uh, is simply pedestrian area. As I pointed out in the plan, the entrance is from the opposite side of the building and I'll show you that approach later on. The front door remains where it was, you can't see it, it's in the shadows here, you go into this open area. The front door is here. Uh, what you're really seeing here, this is the roof of the living room uh, in, in this area. And uh, very important for Wright, and again, you go back to the name of the uh, building, uh, Taliesin, the uh, crowning, <coughs> that it doesn't crown the top of the hillside. Wright never liked the place, of course, it did once or twice, but he never liked the place a building on the top of a hill. He always wanted to integrate with the hill. And you can see how in this uh, courtyard he has retained the, the uh, shape and the original hill and worked the building around actually three sides of the crown of that hill. Now what you see down here uh, I'll show you the interior of this room later on. It's Frank Lloyd Wright's own uh, bedroom and office at this end. Uh, the living room you see would be off in this area, which is repeated right here. But notice the way uh, the limestone is laid up. It's very careful uh, the way he has it laid up. <laughs> you find people trying to imitate it, and they get something that looks very artificial. Uh, Notice also the way in which he includes in the landscape, as he includes on the interior of the house, uh, many objects that come from the Orient, Japanese, Chinese objects. Of course, he was one of the great uh, collectors and the greatest authorities on Japanese print prints, which he collected, but uh, he also collected uh, <coughs> these various works. Now, you see here, the last photograph I took from up here, looking down, I pointed out where Frank Lloyd Wright's 
a bedroom was. You just see the corner of it here. Notice again, Oriental art as it's sitting in this area. And as I say, in a few minutes, I'll show you uh, the interior. Here you see the combination of the stone and the lath and plaster uh, and the woodwork. And how the, the building that you see up there was originally for the cows. This was the barn. Uh, and uh, uh, the horses' stables and so on. In later years, when he needed accommodation for his various apprentices, uh, that all got changed into the residential area rather than being a farm building. Okay, here's that plan <coughs> we looked at before. Uh, <coughs> the difference, this view is like one of Wright's favorite views. It's looking right up in that direction. You're looking right up through there. There's that, that fountain that we saw. Here's the corner of, of Wright's office. And on the next hill, you see the Romeo and Juliet uh, windmill. I mean, he was always so, I mean, that's 1896 in date. And he was always so proud of that windmill. You see that he orientated the whole focal view from the courtyard of Taliesin so that he could always see uh, the windmill on that far hill. And it's, of course, right down the other side of that hill that he built the buildings for his aunts <coughs> for their school and those buildings that he later took over and expanded as uh, 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 the Taliesin Fellowship after 1932. Okay, uh, again, notice the different bits of oriental art. Going on here. Now you see, oh, let's go back to the last pair. Uh, I want to show you. See, here was the Italian in three. This became the parking area. Now I showed you before, when you leave your car here, you go up these steps and get to this point, to the front door. And the next slide will show you that approach. Next door. Um, here you see where you're approaching the stairs. Now you see, see the way Frank Lloyd Wright, he always has these objects uh, or these ways of creating axes and focal points for the axes. Uh, you come along here and you're, you're just not going to keep walking in this direction. You can't help but sort of pick out that wonderful old Ming Dynasty jar sitting there. And you see, you start to go up and have a little better look. And then you move up a few more steps. You see, eventually you go uh, into that open breezeway area. And there's the front door, the living room. Here's the living room fireplace. Here are the windows of the living room, which look down on the lake below. And you see, when you get up those stairs, if you turn around and look back down, uh, this is what you see. You see, it's not a, a straight processional space, but it is something which draws you uh, through these different areas and as you move in one direction and another, in the third direction, in the fourth direction, uh, you get different views that Wright considers important. Okay, <clears throat> now to the interior. When you come into the uh, house, the living room, you come in here or here. These two photographs are the same room at different dates. This is Taliesin 1, 1911, and this is Taliesin 3, after 1925. Um, and you can see the major change takes place in the, his treatment of the ceiling. You can't quite see the fireplace here. You just barely see the edge of the fireplace in, in this photograph. And you can see that Wright has expanded of the building more in this direction, has used more uh, native materials, more of this native land, limestone. And again, as I've said before, Wright always using the same materials inside the building and outside the building. He doesn't have a different <coughs> list of materials for the interior of the building. And again, notice, for instance, the uh, Japanese screen uh, that uh, he uses against the wall of the various objects of, of sculpture uh, that you see in these uh, photographs of the Taliesin 1 and Taliesin 3. This is a photograph that he published in his 19, 
32 edition of his autobiography. And the next slides that I'm going to show you is the same room as it appears today, if you see it in color. Here's that, you might say there's the same room. Here you can just barely see the fireplace here, uh, the over uh, fireplace area, uh, the furniture is all right, the dining area and the living room. And if you turn around, see these chairs that you see here, the round back chairs. Uh, as you look the other direction, you see you're, you're facing out onto the farming land around and that a large lake, you can just barely see a little bit of it uh, in this photograph. But these are recent photographs, uh, not uh, 1950 photographs. Okay, and then going down to Wright's own bedroom that I pointed out on the exterior of the building. Here, in fact, here's his bed right here. Uh, and uh, his desk up here, and again, the view over the farmlands and over the, uh, uh, the lake, and then looking the opposite direction, see this chair here is the chair you see right here. Uh, looking in the opposite direction back towards the fireplace in his bedroom. Uh, here's the area where we saw the reflecting pool with the uh, sculpture standing in the middle of it. You again notice the way he has various objects uh, <coughs> uh, placed around the room. So, next please. Now as I say, when he came back from from Europe in 1911 and started building Taliesin. He, he just couldn't pick up domestic commissions in Chicago because he was socially ostracized uh, because of, of having gone off, left his six children and his wife and gone off <coughs> another client's wife to Europe. Uh, one previous client uh, the Coonleys, for whom he was building a house when he went to Europe, the Coonley House in Riverside, Illinois, is one of the biggest houses that he was to build in his early career. Uh, <coughs> they did come back to him a second time after he got back from Europe and asked them to design for their growing children a playhouse where their children and some of the neighbors' children uh, could could play and, and uh, sort of go to kindergarten and so on. And so in, in 1912, while Wright was uh, 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 finishing the uh, Taliesin one, uh, he built this uh, schoolhouse, or playhouse is a better word for it. In 1912 he built this playhouse for the Coonley family right near their main house. And you can see how, how much more abstract this is. This is like some of those projects I showed you of 1906, uh, such as the uh, uh, Bach Studio or the Yohara Boat Club of 1907. Uh, here is a, a built example of one of these uh, buildings with these uh, very strong horizontal roof forms and so on. And of course, the windows are very fortunate. Unfortunately, all the windows have been sold. Uh, they you find them in many museums around, around the world or in private collections. These are some of the most famous of, of Wright's uh, <coughs> leaded glass windows. But the one major and very important commission that he did get during this period was to build a beer garden in Chicago. And uh, unfortunately, uh, as you know, the United States had, did you have it here too, Prohibition? I know they did in Canada. Did you people have Prohibition? I don't, I don't think so. I, don't well, I mean, when you couldn't, weren't, supposedly weren't allowed to buy or drink any alcoholic beverages. And we're now going through that. This is, I see it as a complete repeat <laughs> with, with drugs. I mean, why, why can't someone have hash or, or whatever? Uh, I mean, but all those years that in North America, you were not allowed, I mean, you could be put in jail if you had a drink of alcoholic beverage. You had a beer, 
Well, of course, to build a beer garden and then have it be illegal to drink beer uh, ruined the beer garden. Anyway, um, <coughs> this was built in suburban Chicago, which to be a typical sort of German uh, beer garden. You see, the far slide is a view face on this area of the beer garden. Uh, the entrances were on both sides, and it was primarily for outside entertainment during the warm spring, summer, fall months of the year. And uh, uh, they also had interior rooms for bad weather or for winter where you could get meals and, and be more uh, collected. But notice the various horizontal slab forms, just as we saw in the Coomley Playhouse a moment ago. And uh, if you uh, look next, please, at a section view of the building, what we saw before was this facade of the building. These are the various dining rooms, interior dining rooms inside the building. Uh, and then there was this big, big, really beer garden. Uh, with tables set up out of doors, and then at the far, far end, there was this band shell uh, so that there could be music uh, uh, played and uh, uh, vibrated really across uh, this very large space. And hundreds and hundreds of tables here. As I say, it went a lot, what year? I can't even remember what year Prohibition began in the United States. It was 19. 22, if I remember But anyway, so Prohibition brought an end to this building, which was uh, apparently a great success. Now, one of the decorative elements here uh, was to make abstract figures. You can see them running along here. Spritz, Frank Playwright called them, S P R I T S, Spritz. And he and uh, uh, a local, uh, a sculptor who lived in, in Chicago uh, worked these out. Of course, both of them claim the origin for these spritz. And I'll show you two examples. Well, before I take this slide off, notice all these uh, various abstract, if you want to call them that, uh, decorative forms that Wright is, is using uh, for this building. And notice the pattern uh, surfaces which he uses here. He's going to pick this up in California uh, in a very few years' time. Okay, so here are these different spritz. This one is by Ian Ellie, and this is one by Ian Ellie, much influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. In fact, here is one of the spritz that was moved to Taliesin. and I photographed it there. Uh, it's the only thing that was saved from, from, the, uh, from the gardens were these various uh, spritz. Uh, the rest of it, of course, was torn down. I mean, it was made into a garage at one point, and tried to make it into stores, and they finally had to tear it down. So uh, the only other uh, important commission that Wright received during this period was, again, away from Chicago, uh, which was the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, Japan. And they started negotiating with him in 1913, about the time that he was building the Midway Gardens that we've just seen. Uh, 1916, he actually started making the uh, drawings and going to Japan. And from 1916 to 1922, in other words, uh, six years of his life was largely spent in Japan developing the designs for uh, the Imperial Hotel and to see to its construction. Um, and again, the Imperial Hotel suffered as, as uh, Japan started to grow upwards instead of horizontally. The land became so valuable they decided they needed a skyscraper hotel there and uh, it was destroyed in the mid-1960s. And the next slide actually shows part of it. At least they moved uh, part of the facade to an architectural uh, 
museum, outdoor architectural museum in, in uh, Japan uh, that has uh, buildings of all different periods of, of Japanese architecture. And uh, these color photographs show it to you, uh, the details of the Imperial Hotel uh, in Japan. But as I mentioned yesterday, the real the tragedy was that it not, not the fact that Wright was being ostracized by Midwesterners in the United States, but the fact that uh, the cultural change was taking place so that uh, no longer were the Midwesterners willing to have the work not only of Wright, but of uh, his various contemporaries. And I'll just very briefly speak of, of this group that I call, in fact, I coined the name, uh, the uh, Prairie School, that is to say, uh, the contemporaries of Frank Lloyd Wright in the Midwest. Now, this is a house that Walter Bertie Griffin, someone who started working for Wright in, in 1901, he built this in 1903. It's the Emory House uh, in the town uh, Elmhurst, Illinois, where, where Griffin lived at the time. Here's a 1906 photograph of it, and here's a recent color photograph of the same building. Uh, Griffin uh, was very uh, successful as an architect. He certainly had an influence upon Wright with many details. Indeed, in that house, he first uses uh, split level uh, floors so that one floor will be half a level above another, something that Wright picked up and repeatedly used in his work. Another house is the Carter House uh, in Evanston, Illinois, 1909-1910 by Walter Burley Griffin. This time it's closer to Wright, but still you can distinguish a different hand. Uh, this is the living room and living room fireplace. Notice the way Griffin has uh, left the ceiling open in this area. That kind of thing we were talking about at the Roby House with Frank Lloyd Wright in the previous lecture. And uh, then in uh, 1912, uh, Griffin, and then married to his wife Marion, began to develop a whole area in, in Iowa, small Iowa city called Mason City, Iowa. And what Griffin did here is very interesting because the comparison I make, here's the site. You can clearly see the site. And you can clearly see the limestone cliffs. Uh, there's a river down here. And you can see that Griffin is picking up the natural uh, landscape and, and making it really the uh, departure point for his design. Now, this design is by Frank Lloyd Wright. It's for the same person, Nelson, and the same site. In fact, you can even see the uh, river meandering down here. Now, this is what Wright was proposing for this very site and for the same client. The client didn't like Wright's design, so he hired Griffin. Uh, but uh, it, it does suggest uh, that some of these uh, apprentices of Wright's uh, were beginning to have an important impact upon Wright's own thinking concerning architectural design. I mean, if this suggests something about pre-Columbian architecture, uh, we certainly find Wright turning to pre-Columbian architecture in the late teens and the early 20s. Next week. Here is uh, work one year later, actually, by the same architect, Walter Burley Griffin. Uh, this is a public library down in a small town in southern Illinois, and in Illinois, the drawing for the library and uh, the building as it stands today. Uh, and again, the suggestion of, of Griffin incorporating certain pre-Columbian architectural ideas uh, in his design, not only the uh, heavy masonry base, uh, the smaller windows, and if we looked at details of the windows, you can see in the far screen, but certainly with these big piers here, all these suggestions of pre-Columbian, and that's something that Wright would soon pick up. But, you see, in 1912, Griffin 
one was uh, international competition for the design of the capital city of Australia, Canberra, Australia. And here you see his original uh, plan. Now see this mount, Mount Ainsley, 2,762 feet. Now my color slide on the opposite screen is taken from there. In other words, we're looking right down here, and this is the government center on the other side of the waterway. Uh, the two fountains you see are in these two uh, bodies of water. There's one of the fountains, there's the other fountain, and uh, uh, this ornamental water around the capital city of Australia now has been named Lake Burley Griffin in honor of uh, Lord Burley Griffin. So of course this drew Griffin to Australia uh, and uh, he did not have to face the problem of clients who were no longer interested in anything uh, that was far from the conservative Western European idea. So here you're looking from Mount Ainsley down through this park area. Here's the government center, the Capitol building you can just barely see here. And as I say, Lake Wolf Burley, or Lake Burley Burton. I don't know why I didn't use it. Well, I suppose that's British. They, they hyphenated his, his middle name and his last name. They called him Burley Burton, whereas really his last name was just Griffin. Um, <coughs> okay, now what happened to write, happened to go to Japan, and then the west coast of the United States. What happened to Griffin, going to Australia, where he could get commissions. Uh, what happened to those people that stayed put in the Midwest? Now this is another uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, former uh, draftsman in his office, William Drummond. This is a house in, in uh, Mason City, Iowa, 1912. And this is by the same architect, 1920. I mean, this is what architects had to do. They either had to get out of the Midwest and go to a less conservative area, or to bow to the new taste that was being imported from the East Coast of the United States to the Middle West of the United States and build something that might uh, look like you see there. Or another case, this is Percy Dwight Bentley. Bentley never studied with Frank Lloyd Wright. He, he uh, studied architecture in Chicago and was a great fan of Wright's work. Uh, he went around and looked at it all. He studied it in great detail. And here in uh, 1950, you can see him in his hometown of La Crosse, Wisconsin building a work that is obviously profoundly influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright. And five years later, in 1920, this is what the same architect had to build uh, in order to receive uh, commissions. Uh, in fact, the, the owners of this house eventually developed courier air conditioning machines. Uh, but anyway, that's a real aside. So th this was the great problem. I mean, in the Midwest, uh, adventuresome clients no longer existed. Now, uh, so the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright and the other prairie school architects really just died with World War I. Uh, and uh, uh, you won't find any works that resemble theirs until the 1950s. In other words, there's a 30-year hiatus when Wright and his contemporaries had no influence. And then in the 1930s, you get the so-called ranch-style house in America. And I mean, there must be hundreds of thousands of these houses built all over the United States and Canada and so on. You can just see rows of them, such as you see here. Now, they're picking up some ideas from Wright. You see, here's, here's a little rough limestone masonry, the fact that the building is only one story high, the fact that the building is more or less L-shaped. But I mean, what remains of, of the genius of the work of, of Wright and his uh, collaborators is very, very little. And this, this uh, a ranch style uh, phenomenon went on for 
well, it's, I shouldn't say it really is dead yet, but it was at its peak during the late 1950s, 1960s, and into the 1970s. And uh, some of the elements thereof you'll find in oh, virtually any building you go into uh, in the United States in this day and age, particularly in, in apartment buildings and so on. That is to say the L-shaped living room dining room. Uh, you see it here. Uh, and this is, I mean, all the sophisticated spatial planning that I've talked about in the previous three lectures. Uh, this is how the American general public interpreted it. Uh, you can see another example. Here you see the dining room or dining area, uh, the living room. Uh, but you see, you don't have that privacy if you're sitting here uh, by a window looking at the fireplace in the dining room. You see, 100% of the dining room, uh, unlike the seclusion and privacy uh, which Wright designed into the houses uh, that he built or which the other architects of the period built. But I mean, in all of these uh, uh, buildings, uh, you can see the quieting influence of the Prairie School architects on American and Canadian architecture in the uh, late 1950s, 1960s, and 1970s. Okay, so, um, as I've said repeatedly, uh, if one wanted to do something adventuresome, you had to get out of the Middle West after World War I. And uh, Wright, of course, was for many years, up until 1922, in uh, uh, Tokyo, Japan, commuting back and forth to California and getting some of his first commissions in California. Uh, and this house for Miss Barnsdale is, uh, she had a great deal of money and, and had a whole estate, I mean, whole hillside uh, just outside of Hollywood. And in 1920, Frank Lloyd Wright built this home for her. Uh, and here the, we bring up the subject of pre-Columbian architecture. There's no question that Wright uh, was being influenced by pre-Columbian architecture, uh, not only from earlier examples we've seen of him picking up details of pre-Columbian in his work, but also we've mentioned Walter Burley Griffin using pre-Columbian, perhaps having some influence on Wright in that regard. But note in this building that this is made of wood, it's a wood frame building and lath and plaster. Uh, it looks as though it was made of concrete, but it is not. It is the traditional materials that Wright had been using in the Midwest, that is to say, wood frame and then covered with lath and plaster. Now, the house takes its name from these stylized polyhols plants that you see running along here. And uh, this is the living room, reflecting pool here. Off to one side is the dining room. This is the library. It's a U-shaped building with the living room at the bottom of the U uh, looking out from the top of this hillside uh, towards Hollywood in, in California. Here are those uh, cast uh, in concrete, these cast stylized holly, uh, hollyhocks. And uh, uh, I only bring back this slide of Unity Temple of 1904, 1905, to show you how there he used a stylized uh, plant form. And particularly, this was carried out in the, uh, in the hollyhock house design. The next slide. Uh, we look at the plan and the interior. Here's that living room, reflecting pool out in front, the hollyhocks that we saw running around this area. And here is a view taken from right here, looking towards the fireplace, interesting fireplace, because he has a reflecting pool here to reflect the flames of the fire. Uh, and notice right as an abstract uh, designer, 
the different forms in which you use it. It reminds me a great deal of the 1939 World's Fair in New York, actually. The circular forms here, uh, triangular forms uh, that he uses to decorate the over mantel. The entrance to the house is along this side. The kitchen is here, excuse me, it's along here. The kitchen area is here. Uh, the private parts of the house, the library, the bedrooms, and so on along here, and the living room uh, that we see at that point. So whereas here, uh, Wright is using the same materials that he had been using since 1900 uh, in his work, uh, he is taking his uh, source of inspiration, not from the vernacular, of American architecture, but going much further back, going back to pre-Columbian days to get the ideas for these building forms. And in the next building that he does in California, this is in Pasadena, uh, California, right near uh, Los Angeles, a suburb of Los Angeles. Uh, and he did the Millard House. Now, Mrs. Millard was a former client. She used to live in Illinois. Uh, the Millards built a house by Frank Lloyd Wright, not one that I have to show you. And then uh, when her husband died, she moved out to California and commissioned Wright for uh, uh, this second house in, in Pasadena, uh, California. Now here, you see, unlike the, the Hollyhawk house that we've just seen, where Wright was using traditional materials uh, in a traditional construction manner, here he is inventing a new system of, of uh, construction. Basically, he felt that you had these uh, blocks in pre-Columbian architecture, and somehow he should recreate these blocks. And what he did was to cast uh, concrete into uh, blocks and then assembled. You can just barely see the, how they're assembled. I mean, you see, here's a block, for example, right here. You can see how thick the block is. It's that thick. It's not all that thick. Then there's this airspace between the outside block and the inside block. And you notice each block has a groove running around all four sides of the block. Therefore, uh, Reinforcing rods can be put through the grooves on the two sides of each block and laid horizontally across the top of the blocks. And then the mortar, uh, obviously a fairly uh, uh, fluid mortar, uh, is poured into these areas. And you can see how he builds up the construction uh, in this way. So this becomes a block construction. And this is something that he continued to use for many, many years uh, in his work. Now here you see the exterior of the building. Uh, he uh, situated, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Millard had bought a, a, a piece of property two or three lots down, uh, which was sort of ideal, quote unquote, and Wright persuaded her to sell it and buy this little ravine that nobody wanted and it was swampy and so on, and Wright converted it into a reflecting pool and uh, situated her house down in this ravine. Now, here you can clearly see the blocks. You notice the basic pattern here is a cross with a circular a motif in each one of these, uh, in each one of the sections of the cross, and uh, here you can see uh, Pre-Columbian design uh, undoubtedly is taking his uh, decorative motif from these pre-Columbian scrolls. We would see the same building uh, in, in color. It's not actually a very large building. Uh, it was primarily her home, and she collected a certain number of antiques, which she kept at that site. Then came another. Well, we had several of these uh, contracts or houses <coughs> in the Los Angeles area. Uh, this one is in Los Angeles itse itself. Uh, and here you can very clearly see 
uh, my detailed photograph of simply one of the blocks, and I realize that that block is probably about 15 inches square uh, in size. It's been blown up greatly here. But you see him working out an abstract design. This is no longer a pre-Columbian design. You see now he's moving one step further to uh, using, uh, to creating his own uh, abstract design uh, for the individual blocks uh, that are, are made in this way. You can see it's a mammoth house, it's a very, very large house. And uh, uh, you approach it from a road that winds its way up here and winds on the hill, goes up considerably further. This is on the side of the hill. Uh, and then these big uh, windows, and you can see a different way in which he's used different patterns, three different patterns at uh, different parts of the house. Uh, for uh, these blocks, and all constructed, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, <coughs> of, of using these blocks, precast blocks, then tying them together with these uh, reinforcing rods and mortar uh, to fill in uh, between the rods and the concrete area in the brickwork. Now, while he was doing all of this in California, uh, he was executing many commissions, alas, uh, that uh, never saw the light of day. Now you have to remember that this is the 1920s we're talking about, and some of these big commissions, this was for uh, California, the uh, uh, Dahoney Ranch scheme. I mean, this was to be a big residential area. This is all the vigil of these concrete blocks that you did just looking at. And these would be different roadways and different apartments and different houses. An incredibly fabulous scheme, which, like so many schemes in the 1920s, died in October 1929 with the Great Depression. Uh, obviously, there was no more money to build things like this, or this one in, in uh, uh, Arizona near Chandler, which I show you particularly because you see here the budding interest of right, coming back to what I was talking about in lecture, I guess, number one and two, when we discussed the uh, uh, Froebel kindergarten and those triangular forms, equilateral triangles, and so on. And so in the 20s, we finally begin to uh, see right using these triangular forms, which in the 1930s and 1940s uh, in the 1950s are to become ever increasingly more important for uh, in his architecture. Uh, the same thing can be said for circular forms. Uh, this was a commission he had that died because of the uh, uh, depression in the late 20s. This was 1925. This wealthy man wanted to build an automobile objective on the top of a mountain in Maryland. Maryland is the state next to Washington, D.C. I and mean, this would be about an hour's drive from Washington. The idea was that people could drive there and they could drive their car up uh, around those circular roadways and then at the very top it would be reversed so that you could come down the other way uh, in, in this uh, automobile objective. In the interior, was going to be a great, uh, you know, what's the word I want? You know, where he's planetarium. There was to be a big planetarium on the interior, there would be restaurants, all kinds of entertainment for people who would come out and explore by the automobile uh, this uh, man-made mountain atop of a mountain. Of course, she realized that eight years after this, in 1943, Wright got the commission to design the Guggenheim Museum in New York. This is the genesis of the idea for the Guggenheim Museum. And Wright's first schemes for the Guggenheim are building slanted this way. It was only later to be slanted the other way in, in subsequent projects, including the executed uh, Guggenheim Museum. Uh, 1920s again. This was another one of those big projects that never got off the ground. It was to be at Lake Tahoe 
in the Sierra Nevada mountains of, of California, between the border really of California and, and um, I don't know the name of it. Nevada. What? Nevada. Nevada, thank you. And Nevada. Uh, and uh, oh, Lake Tahoe is fascinating because I like it most for skiing. It's my, one of my favorite ski places. But anyway, uh, it's an incredibly deep lake. It's so deep, deep it doesn't even freeze in the winter. It's quite fantastic. But anyway, Wright was given this commission to design uh, a resort at Lake Tahoe. And uh, <coughs> his scheme was to make houseboats. This was one of the houseboat schemes. And houses that would be on the, on the uh, mountain slopes around this deep bay uh, in, in Lake Tahoe. Uh, and here you see he's picking up Native uh, American, that is to say Indian, uh, uh, forms, that is to say the teepee shape uh, that he picks up to use for the roof forms here. So you see, in all of these examples that I've been showing, he, he's uh, studying as much as possible uh, ways in which to use not European sources for his inspiration, uh, but to turn to natural sources, such as a mountain form, but really to, to study the indigenous architecture of earlier peoples in, in uh, the Americas, whether it be pre-Columbian or whether it be uh, uh, local Indians uh, that might live uh, further north in the uh, continent of uh, North America. So this is very important. He's rethinking this whole question of, of uh, sources. Where we saw earlier, he was uh, synthesizing American architecture architecture. Now he's synthesizing the architecture that came before Western Europeans moved to uh, the American continent. Next week. Okay. Now, some very interesting projects, and some of these I'm going to touch on in the last lecture, uh, that went unbuilt. Uh, one is 1922. This was for this was to be right in downtown Chicago. I wish it had been built. Um, <coughs> it was the Natural Life uh, Insurance Company building headquarters it was to be. You see there's some uh, uh, stylistic relationship here to those uh, hollyhocks that we were looking at in the hollyhock house and so on. You see there were to be four cross elements uh, that would go into that single uh, higher slab that you see in the background, and that would be all the circulation. All the circulation would take place in that area behind this, this area. That's where the elevators all were, uh, and the fire escapes, the service, and so on. And these basically were four uh, skyscraper buildings to be used by uh, National Life Insurance Company uh, in Chicago as their headquarters. And then uh, just a few years later, the late 20s, right, designed for uh, the minister uh, of this church who had the idea that uh, it would be nice to create uh, tall apartment buildings for his congregation that would be near the church as New York was growing. This is in the uh, lower part of New York City. Well, I suppose you all know about it. The World Trade Center, not too far from, from uh, that area uh, today. And Wright designed these uh, apartment buildings, which were to be the seed of many schemes that he was to develop uh, the rest of his life. The St. Mark's and the Bowery, the Bowery area of New York, the St. Mark's and the Bowery apartment buildings um, had a very different a structural system that I'll talk about in a future lecture. You notice, you can see it right here. In other words, there are no exterior supporting walls. In other words, Wright gets away from the idea that exterior walls, like the walls of a box, should support uh, the building, but uh, the, the, the 
floor should be cantilevered out uh, from uh, the pinwheel-like form uh, that is in the center of, of the building. But St. Mark's and the Bowery suffered the same fate as these other projects that I've mentioned, that is to say the 1929 Depression when nobody had the uh, funds to uh, go ahead with major construction. <coughs> and then uh, what happened was that with, in 1936, uh, one of the men that he'd accepted as an planet, apprentice, Edgar Cowden Jr., uh, the son of a very wealthy uh, uh, department store uh, magnate in Philadelphia, went to work for Frank Lloyd Wright, went out to Taliesin to uh, work for him. And uh, what uh, Edgar Jr. managed to do was to persuade his father to uh, build their country house on a design by Frank Lloyd Wright. And in the next lecture on Wednesday, remember I don't have a lecture tomorrow, the schedule's been changed because of the uh, uh, Cedric Price Memorial that's taking place here tomorrow afternoon. So my next lecture's gonna be on Wednesday. Uh, and uh, so in 1936, Wright got this commission to uh, design for Edgar Kaufman Jr., Jr.'s father, uh, the Falling Water House, which I suppose at this point, I mean, it's often published as the most famous house in the world. I don't know if that's true or not. But they say it is in the, in the United States anyway. Uh, Wright was to design the Falling Water House, and that was very important. That marked his real comeback. See, this is 1936. In 1932, remember, he had published his autobiography. In 1932, he founded the Taliesin Fellowship. Uh, and it's these events in this short period of time, 1932 to 1936, uh, when Wright finally makes his comeback. Uh, people have forgotten about his private sex life and a few other things, uh, and uh, turn to him. And certainly the autobiography, and I've urged you previously, I urge you again to have a look at the autobiography, because that really had an incredible impact on American architecture. I cannot tell you how many scores of clients who later after the 1930s, commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to build their houses, would always say, I've read the autobiography, and reading Wright's words and what he believed in made me want to have him as my architect. So uh, the, these various events of the early 30s, the autobiography, the Taliesin Fellowship, and the other important thing about this house, of course, it's the money. It's the first time, you see, Frank Lloyd Wright has had a chance to build a major, very expensive building uh, where the sky was the limit in terms of money. And what did he do with that money? He started to build a new home for himself, Taliesin West. Uh, and so, in the lecture on Wednesday, I'll start off by discussing these two buildings. And again, this is my, one of my early photographs. If you go to Taliesin today, you would not see it that way. Uh, I took this photograph when I was visiting Mr. Wright at Taliesin West. Uh, all of this has been destroyed. And they just poured concrete here uh, in the foreground. But, well, I better save that for <laughs> uh, I mean, to me, to me, I could talk for an hour about that one slide. I mean, it says so much about life. Look at that slide and think about axes and how you're going to be drawn, how you're going to think about your physical movements in this space. And I wish the slide was broad enough to show you what goes on here, but you can see there's a prow here. One thing happens here, which happens to be a view overlooking Phoenix 20 miles away. Uh, 
And then you have this other choice, are you going to walk this way? Look at all the, all the focal points he has here. Whether it be the pictographs on the stone, whether it be this cacti standing here, which he's celebrated by building a masonry wall around it. Or look what is in the far distance. Think of, think of the Willits House plan that I spent so much time discussing, these different focal points. Look at that strange object down there, which is a stone standing in uh, a reflecting pool. You see how all these things draw you in this space. Uh, you're not going to go in that direction because you're not going to fly to Phoenix, which you can only see just desert all the way to Phoenix. You're not going to go in amongst all these cacti <coughs> and get yourself uh, <laughs> uh, scraped to death. But you see, you, you want to study the pictographs. So that's the closest thing to you. So you mount a few of these stairs and you study the other side of the pictograph. And then when you're looking at the far side of the pictograph, you see you say, well, what about that thing I saw way back somewhere else? And you'll turn around and see here, under this pergola, uh, this form. You go down, when you finally get to the point at which the question you have in your mind is answered, what is that object there? You'll find the wall of the building opens up on your right-hand side, and you walk through it, and there's the entrance to Taliesin. So the entrance isn't here. You pass through all these different spatial experiences uh, to gain access to the building. All right, so those two buildings are the opening of my lecture on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Oh, if there are any short questions, sure. Let me go. So you came up the last one. Okay. <laughs>